Hello, everyone. Welcome to Media Club at the Media Education Lab. I'm your host and facilitator, Kuntujur Devina. And it's a very, very special Media Club for me today because uh, we have Professor Usha Raman and Dr. Sumana Kasturi, uh, editors of the book Trialscape, Mediascape, Children in Media in India. Uh, and uh, we're all together part of the Department of Communication, University of Hyderabad, India. And a lot of authors, uh, a lot of people uh, involved in this project uh, were part of the department. So it's very much a department baby. Um, if you don't know already, uh, Professor Usha Raman is also my supervising professor. And she always gives me uh, shout outs when she's talking about work in the area of children in uh, digital and social media in India. Thank you so much. This is my shout out back to you, Usha Ma'am. Uh, she's also the current co-vice president of INCR, which is the International Association for Media and Communication Research. And Dr. Savannah Kasturi was also part of the department. She completed her PhD with Professor Vinod Pavrala. And she is an independent research. Currently, she has an amazing book on the blogosphere in India. And I'm going to add a link to chat for all of you to look at. But today, what we're discussing is this amazing book uh, that's been quite a product of our, yes, <laughs> that book, that has been a product of our passion and a lot of <laughs> sort of tiring, but sort of exciting but, and sort of um, interesting and amazing work that, that people have really labored for. So over to you. Thank you, Devina, and um, thanks to the Media Club for hosting us. Um, Sumana and I are still, I think, in a slight state of shock that this book is actually here in physical form. Um, we uh, started work on it, now it seems like eons ago, but um, and I think this is probably true of many academic books, um, but we started thinking about this almost um, seven or eight years ago, uh, because both of us have an interest in um, uh, media literacy, critical media studies, and, um, and we're both parents as well. Um, you know, we've uh, both been, um, we've hopped across continents with our kids. So we've watched how they've consumed media in different contexts. And I think we felt that there was space for a book that, um, really looked seriously at how Indian children inhabited um, a world that was full of media. And um, um, of course, you know, we come from a particular section of society and we didn't want to limit our exploration just to um, that group of children. Um, and um, so we decided we would try and uh, pull together um, a group of scholars from across India who could speak to this broader theme of um, children and media in India. Um, so we started off, it was not an open call uh, because um, we had a certain idea of how we wanted the book to, um, to uh, develop. Um, we were very clear that we wanted to take a critical uh, approach to uh, looking at children and media. And um, we wanted as wide um, um, a sort of scope as possible in terms of looking at media broadly, not just digital media, but also legacy media, um, media conceived of very broadly, including comic books, uh, story books, um, educational material, possibly, et cetera. So we set out looking for scholars across the country who were working in this area. And um, we found that it was very difficult to find people. Um, there's uh, There's been very little work on children and media in the country or in the subcontinent even. Um, and um, so it was surprising because, you know, across the globe, uh, probably since the 60s, there has been quite a lot of interest in how children consume or are represented in media. But in India, there was practically nothing. Um, so we had to uh, reach out to specific people that we knew um, had an interface with um, media and children or had an opinion or were working in contexts where um, media was uh, crucial to their interactions with children. Um, so that's how the book came about. And um, 
Um, so it, we have 12 chapters in the book um, uh, divided into four uh, or five different sections. Davina's in the book as well, Anita's in the book. Um, and we were hoping to have some of our other authors join us, but I think um, it's late in India, so it's been difficult to get everybody on board. Um, so what we'd like to do is, um, you know, uh, run through the, uh, the broad framework of the book. And I understand uh, Devina's already shared with you all the opening chapter, the introductory chapter, which lays out that scope. Uh, um, and, um, and we'll take you through the, the theoretical frameworks that informed our work. Um, and, but we'd like to keep this interactive. So, um, you know, we hope that you will have questions for us and we can be a little more pointed in that. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Sumana now to start off with uh, talking about the four areas of scholarship that really have informed um, uh, our approach to the book and that are represented in uh, the 12th chapter. Yeah, I've unmuted myself. Good morning, um, since most of you are on the other side of the world. Uh, thank you for starting your day with us. Um, so yeah, to give you a sense of what we were doing, um, as teachers, as parents, as media researchers, we tend to think about um, uh, media in relation to children in, in terms of sort of a, with a sense of panic or often because we're thinking, oh, there's so many new things going on. A child now experiences his or her childhood in very different ways than we have, may have experienced it. And so there's a disconnect between our experience of childhood and a current child's experience. Um, and then there is also the sense that this media technology and things are going to go south and all of the concerns that come with new media technologies. The thing is, these are not new concerns. You know, when radio was introduced, when television was introduced, when video cassettes and video games, every time something new comes up, um, there is a sense of loss of control or lack of control from the adults and a feeling that this is going to, you know, ruin or, you know, fundamentally change childhood. And that, that sense of um, confusion or panic or concern is, has been never more uh, of an issue than now, because social media has, and digital media has sort of so fundamentally changed the nature of all of our lives and definitely children's lives. Again, there's a disconnect. Some of the, the vocabularies, the vocabulary around their usage has changed. And sometimes some of us don't even understand, um, you know, the things that they're doing or the, um, you know, the practices that surround media use. Now, um, we took the idea of, so we're talking about childhood as a concept first, before we start talking about media. And we often think of childhood as a universal concept of, you know, as an innocent phase, a biological phase of growth, nurture, nurturing, and innocence. Um, the thing is that the, this concept of childhood is actually a historical construct. It comes out of a very specific socioeconomic context. Um, and we tend to use those ideas that are socioculturally uh, built and start to think of them as universal and across the board. And so one of the key things we wanted to do in this with this book and with generally thinking about media studies in the context of children and media is that there's no one childhood. We, we should not fall into the trap of like a heteronormative middle class child's life. <clears throat> so um, the nature of childhood or a childhood experience is dramatically different based on where that child is located geographically, but also in terms in the US, we talk about race and class. In India, it's not, it's not as much race, but we talk about caste and class and geographical location. All of these together form what childhood means. And then if you throw, it's already complicated. And then if you throw media into the mix, we remember that media um, tell us in some way, who we are or show us what we are and tell us what we 
you know, help us think about the way we are and think about the world. And when it comes to children, then this is even more so because they're so much more, um, because they are as much embedded in it as we are. Um, so, so then we're talking about a key aspect that we discuss in media studies is representation. How are children represented in the media, in adult general media, news, entertainment, um, and so on? And how are children represented or how do they see themselves within child-centric media? Right? Those are the two sort of broad categories of how children are generally represented and how children are represented in child-centric media. And often there are just those two different representations are often on two ends of a spectrum. On the one hand, showing a child, you know, that famous picture, um, you know, of the, uh, what was that child's name? I forget. Of the little body washed up on the shore, it sort of I, epitomized the Syrian Kurt, refugee Kurt. crisis. Yeah, the, the epitomized the Syrian refugee crisis that no amount of reporting did, right? Um, so in, children are often deployed in these very uh, particular ways to sort of create a message of um, of crisis or disaster, and you know, and so they are they are shown as sort of um, vulnerable and sort of being able, sort of, what's the word, being swept away by circumstances of somebody with no agency whatsoever. On the other hand, when we're looking at child-centric media, often um, there's these, there's child heroes and you, or we validize children uh, who have, you know, done special things. Um, and so there's these two, uh, two ends of the spectrum. But when we, so then there are these two, but what is the reality for many of the children who, so that's a question that we were starting to think about or that we want to talk about. Um, the other thing is whose voices are heard, whose voices are not heard? Who do we visibilize and who do we invisibilize? So often, and this has been true of research in the West and is now being researched in India as well, but the the norm is the middle class um, urban child, and anything outside of that is either invisible or deviant, or funny, or any of those things. So those were some of the issues that we were talking about in terms of representation. Um, what was that one other thing I was going to say? So the, the default is, is of these urban middle-class children. And you see that in television shows and so on as well. And so as researchers, our question is, in general and for, with the context of the book, how do we step away from centering and normalizing children who are within this very narrow space, actually? Because if you see intersectionally, there are children who are coming from many different locations and have very different childhood experiences. And so we were talking about, so the book has many, has a few chapters where we're discussing representation. So did I go longer than I needed to, Demina? Sorry. That's fine. Um, so should I go on? With the yeah, next, yeah, please, uh, over to you for the so, next section. Yeah, so um, so the as as we mentioned, there are four broad areas of scholarship that we're draw, drawing on, and uh, Sumana just talked about representation, and of course there is a lot of work in the Western context on how the child is represented in media or how children's media actually encapsulate uh, the the child. Um, so the next uh, broad area of scholarship that we were looking at was. Uh, children, media, and globalization. And in fact, the book is called Childscape Mediascape. And um, to some of you, this may recall um, Arjun Apadurai's Five Scapes, um, although that was not our intention initially. But the more I thought about it when this question came up was, of course, you know, when you talk about mediascape in Apadurai's context, um, you are talking about a media now that is no longer purely uh, local. Even if it is produced locally, it can travel globally. And if it is produced elsewhere, it can become localized in, in strange ways. Um, so I was talking to one of my students, for instance, who was talking about growing up watching Hannah Montana on Disney. 
And um, I think uh, many of you, uh, you know, who uh, particularly those of you who live in the US uh, are familiar with Hannah Montana, right? Um, and so she was saying that when she watched Hannah Montana in India, it was dubbed into at least three Indian languages. And, um, and there was a difference between the children who watched it in English and those who watched it in with the Hindi dubbing. Um, it, it was a strange kind of parallax, the way they understood Hannah Montana. Um, so that's that's really not something we talk about in in our, in our uh, book. But uh, what it what it implies is that globalization has created a media scape for children that, at one level, um, it could mean that a child in India is watching the same or similar content as a child in the U.S. But it could also mean that children in India. Um, exist in a media scape that is very distant from their everyday lives. Um, so this you know, speaks again to uh, the sort of questions of representation that Sumana was talking about. Um, but another thing globalization has done is that um, it has um, in some ways shrunk the world for the child. Um, so a child growing up in India can um, uh, is feel can feel as close to the same sort of cultural content as a child in the U.S. can, or a child growing up in uh, South Korea can. Um, but at the same time, it's also um, created a space where issues of identity, issues of who I am in the world, and so on, become extremely complex. So, um, globalization in terms of you know what what kinds of content reach children uh, and what kinds of content can emanate from children in both ways. I think both children as producers as well as children as consumers of content um, has become extremely complex um, because of globalization. So um, you think about, for instance, um, uh, a show like um, the BBC's uh, Happy Pod. This is a new show that the BBC has launched, which is a once a week roundup of positive news from around the world. And um, and what very often on that show, you have children um, and their content being featured um, on a global news show, um, which uh, would not have happened maybe 25, 30 years ago. I mean, if you had a child from India speaking on BBC News, it would usually be very specific exoticized kind of content, whereas today that's no longer the case. Uh, I think there is more diverse everyday content being created by children and circulated globally. So um, so in some ways, um, you know, globalization or the processes of globalization have created um, a broader market for children's literature, children's uh, media content. But it's also meant that representation becomes much more of a fraught activity. Um, and, you know, what kinds of voices are going to be uh, included in this global media scape? Um, so, um, so, yeah, so, so in some ways, what we wanted to do was to move away from the, um, the notion of the Indian child as, um, as being subsumed within this globalization, but also a point to the specific ways in which Indian sociocultural realities might complicate the ways in which a child in India consumed global media content. Now, I know that's you know a lot of big words thrown in together, um, but I think no matter where one lives in the world now, you cannot get away from global flows of information. Um, so what does it mean to be a child and watching certain things or um, buying certain things, um, yet you look out the window and your world is very different from um, the kind of world you see uh, on these shows that are streamed to you from um, elsewhere. Um, so, so just to point to the fact that growing up these days um, is, um, growing up has always been complicated. Um, but it becomes uh, infused with a different kind of um, climate because of global media. Um, so the next theme that um, you know we'll speak to, and I'm going to hand over to Sumana again, 
um, is a uh, tariff political economy, which um, I think is extremely important, particularly when, you, when you're talking about children's content. Yeah, uh, this is a, a subject that's close to my heart. I've been thinking and working on it for over 20 years, and I think it's become even more important than ever to think about these ideas. So the idea of political economy of communication is to think about, oh, that is, sorry, distracting me, Garina. Uh, sorry. But how social and institutional, sorry, how social and institutional structures may be designed to legitimize and maintain the status quo, right? Um, so we look at how institutional structures, corporate entities, are set up to uh, maintain a capitalist structure. And I don't want to fall into these words, but the idea is that what are, I mean, it's just past time that we start questioning where these media companies are coming from, what their motives are, how much of it is a profit motive, and so on and so forth. And then, because again, it's, it's, it's true for all of us, and, and I think this goes without saying, anything that we discuss in, in terms of children is also rele relevant to all of us as adults as well. Um, but since we're focusing on childhood and the, and the way they experience media, so what are the narratives that children are absorbing? What are the lessons that they are learning um, about this? 20 years ago, I think it was 20 years ago, I wrote my master's thesis on a new, it was it was a new thing at the time, the Disney website um, that children could click. And it was sort of like the online version of a theme park. And um, back then we were talking about um, all of it. What is Disney teaching them beyond, you know, the whatever the Disney stories. And I concluded then that they were, we were, they, we were sort of, they were in some sense being groomed to be consumers, better consumers. And that has only intensified as things have, you know, technologies have grown. So the question is, what are the narratives that our children are getting? Not just from media companies, but also obviously from, from user generated content, but all of it is uh, sort of dictated by an algorithm that seems to be some sort of undefined, um, um, sort of a, nobody's questioning how the algorithm works at some level, right? Um, so the question is, who owns the media? Who owns the stories? What stories are they telling our children? And what stories are our children absorbing? And it's super vital in this, even more so in this age. And so, you know, political economy of communication is a large area. And um, one of the things that they talk about is that media companies create, do not create content for consumers, but consumers for advertisers or markets for advertisers. And so if we take that and put it into the context of childhood, the question is, are, are our media companies um, delivering content to entertain children or are they grooming and creating a body of young con consumers? That's one question. But also are these children then commodi commodified in their own way? Because then you're taking this body and selling them to something, to some other entity. And then issues of, well, data privacy are, are, often, are, are you know, serious for everybody including children, there's the issue of um, grooming and in, with regard to children specifically in this day and age, there's a, there's a huge issue around um, tra human trafficking and child pornography. Um, that is, again, these are old concerns that sort of seem to have become amplified with new media technologies. Um, and again, who owns this content? what is the primary motive of this circulation of content? And how quickly have our children become commodified uh, in this global transnational flow of media content? Um, that, that's the main thing, but there was, um, 
There was one more thing I wanted to. Yeah, so there is the issue of commodifying children. There's the issue of data privacy. And then there's the issue of, um, <clears throat> why did I forget the thing? I was going to make a point. Yeah, the question is who gains and who loses in this process? And when will we sort of, as media researchers, as parents, as teachers, we are talking about these issues. But for the everyday, I think that our media practices have become so embedded in our lives, it's hard to think about um, who is, you know, sort of um, um, gaining from this larger issue of um, um, commodification of children at some level. Um, I had a point I was going to make. I see it seems to have just flown out the window. If I think of it, I'll come back to it. Devina, do you have do you remember the point I'm making? I think you were going to talk about lack of regulation for that. Oh, that's a whole other thing that um, I don't want to go into. Uh, yeah, I mean it needs to. It definitely needs. We need to regulate, and then the media companies actually have uh, set up uh, some kind of a self-regulatory body that that they don't listen to. Um, I happen to know somebody who's on that um, um, committee and it's just a junk, nothing happens. Um, but yeah, not talk about uh, regulation and I will answer Usha's thing about the whole, <laughs> there's a whole industry around Disney. I was part of it. <laughs> it's super tempting and very interesting. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'll stop there and I'll let uh, Usha take on the, our last um, theoretical framework that we've used in the book. And that is the idea of moving away from thinking of uh, children as passive consumers and therefore completely vulnerable, um, you know, as you know, the hypodermic needle theory and so on, to the idea of children as active audiences and the issue. So basically moving from effects to agency. And that's super important and relevant in this day and age. Usha, over to you. Thanks, thanks, Sumana. So just very quickly, this last bit. Um, and I think we've already spoken about the fact that we very much wanted to move away from this notion that uh, children are uh, simply recipients uh, or being acted upon by media uh, to uh, a growing recognition across media studies that you know nobody and particularly not children, are simply sitting there and being affected by media. Um, they're also doing things with it. Um, but then that also creates complications, right? So, um, so when you treat children as active producers of media or people who are engaging actively with media, there also then is the potential for that creativity to be exploited and for um, that notion of engagement to be exploited, as we've seen um, you know, with all the studies around social media and uh, screen time and so on. Um, but really the way in which we are talking about uh, agency uh, in the chapters in the book uh, and the way the authors that have contributed to that particular section or those sections of the book have looked at it is children who are um, not just creating media as an act of leisure, but uh, using media to define themselves and their communities and visibilize themselves and their communities in particular ways. So uh, we have, uh, for instance, uh, one of our chapters, uh, Vasuki Belavadi talks about young people in um, a rural uh, area in India uh, who are using media um, uh, in their uh, civic um, engagement. So uh, using media as a way of uh, improving life in their village of uh, speaking truth to power and so on. So um, so that is one um, kind of example. Another example that we have is of Samina Mishra, who, and I think um, Devina has linked to her chapter in the chat, um, who uh, looked at how children um, develop an idea of citizenship, of uh, them being um, legitimate occupants of a democracy um, you know, in the way they use media. So of course she uses media as a way of um, sensitizing children to civic issues, but um, then children take on these ideas and then uh, 
you know, uh, continue to engage with media to build their own sense of who they are in a democracy. Um, so this is one way in which um, I think across the world, um, you know, children's engagement with media is um, uh, is being documented, is being used in um, both in literacy efforts as well as in civic engagement efforts um, that involve children. So one of the things that, for instance, the disability movement talks about is nothing about us without us. Um, and I think that's becoming very true of children uh, and media as well. So when uh, we talk about um, uh, children's media or media uh, that um, surrounds children, we also have to understand from children how they are engaging with those media and how um, they are, um, you know, uh, uh, I don't want to use the word affected, but okay, let's use it as a placeholder, um, how they are being affected by it. Um, so uh, children as active participants, active, uh, active agents within media is, um, is um, something that we're very interested in. Um, but also, I think there are, um, we wanted to see if there were uh, efforts in India to do the kinds of things uh, that we're seeing in certain other contexts. So Melissa Nolas and her colleagues in the UK, for instance, have this um, really ama amazing project called Childhood Publics, where they are looking at children, not just as, um, again, passive consumers, but as a public. And the moment you look at children as a public, it means that you are giving um, them or you're looking at them as a group of individuals who can communicate with each other, engage in a discourse, actually create discourse. Um, and, um, and I'm sure that there are, um, you know, groups of children doing that across the world. And um, so we wanted to at least offer that as a frame. Uh, as a way of thinking about how we might look at children in today's media world. Um, and increasingly, children are engaging with media outside of formal settings. Um, again, 25, 30 years ago, we had a, a sense that you know, children were watching television. You could see what they were doing while they were watching television. You could see what they were watching. Um, but now children's media worlds are carried around in the palms of their hands. Um, so we have very little uh, insight into, you know, what they're engaging with. Um, so it means we need to understand that. And the only way to understand that is by engaging with children as a public. Um, so that is, um, the, you know, one of the things that we were interested in exploring. And I feel like um, in some way, the, uh, the four or the five sections in the book um, speak to some of these issues. Uh, Sumana and I are very conscious of the fact that this is a very, very, um, it, it's just a thin slice of what one could do and what could, one could research um, in relation to children and media in India. Um, so for instance, Anita, who is here, um, her chapter looks at uh, everyday use of, um, you know, digital technologies by young people. And I think the key to this is the everyday, right? Um, digital media and media in general are now everyday objects, um, maybe not even objects, the everyday environment in which children live. So how do we then unpack uh, the various ways in which um, children work with media, media work with and through children? Um, so yes, so that's uh, what we're, um, what we'd like to do as an ongoing project. So over to you, Devina. Uh, any questions, anything that, you know, any thoughts that others have? Thank you so much, uh, Usha Mam and Sumana Mam. And uh, I open uh, the floor to other attendees. It'd be great if you could unmute yourself and ask a question or make a comment. We had the television, this is Barbara Harrison, and I think it was about 1991, 92, the Children's Television Act, which eliminated um, the opportunities that um, brands advertising in the middle of a program. So they would incorporate, say, cereal 
into and try to sell children cereal. It had to be separate. Now, as I commented, I did a paper on the Telecommunications Act of 1996, which deregulated traditional media in preparation for the internet. I don't know if that act from the early 90s is, is still in effect. I, I, I haven't thought of that for, for quite a while. But um, children, they have taken advantage of them since a long time ago, <laughs> you know, especially when television came in. And it's just gotten worse and worse. And parents are really not educated about what's going on in the television. Well, now it's the Internet is like a babysitter, you know, so we'll stick the kid in front of the TV and. Now I see people in the supermarket and it's like, you know, try talking to your child about what you're buying and counting and looking at colors and, you know, bringing them into the process. But I, I don't see that. Is there, is there a move in India like the EU is regulated? Their internet is regulated and they find people for the data breaches. Is there any move in India? to to do that to regulate um no in fact everybody is, cites yeah. the gdpr as uh, a model um and i think europe has set a high bar for the rest of the world to follow um in india it's we're waiting for um uh, uh, a new act that is supposed to come into or at least be announced in august um but my sense is that they're still not thinking about um, the broader ramifications of digital life and particularly children tend to be an ignored uh, uh, group. Um, and one might say that, you know, in countries like India and emerging economies, there are so many other uh, issues that seem to dominate politics, if not life, um, that um, there's not much advocacy either for, um, you know, to regulate on behalf of children. And of course, they don't vote. So, why? Yeah. <laughs> why yeah. bother? So, there's a question in the chat that says Could you talk to children five to seven years to understand their fascination for watching TV? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, this is, yeah, so this is, uh, maybe Sumana has something to add to this, but I think. You know, it, it, Barbara just said that we use it, use television as a babysitter. Yes. And I think this goes back to who's made them that way. It's the parents who's, who have sat them down in front of the TV when perhaps they were overwhelmed and then that just becomes a habit. So um, we, uh, we have not done any work with children in that age group. Um, but... Um, yeah, this is something that I don't know that we're, we're going to get any responses from children. We have to talk to the parents. Yeah, but then um, absolutely this conversation is throwing up lots of new avenues to explore. And we would welcome people who see the gaps to fill them by doing the research. It would be fantastic if we did talk more about it. But yeah, I mean, as much as it pains me to complain about parents or lay the blame on parents. Everybody's dealing with their own. Everybody's dealing with a sense of overwhelm. And it is just so easy to put on that little show and prop them in front of it. Um, yeah, it's not the children. It definitely has to be about parents. And I'll go back to political economy, uh, to the media companies that are sort of enabling this. And, and I mean it in a specific way because some time ago, remember, there was those, there's a set of YouTube videos that were supposed to be about one thing, but once children got onto them, they were about other things. I mean, they were just like these fake cartoon or animation shows and so on. Those are algorithmically pushed. I mean, there is, there is a possibility to fix these, at least some of these holes that I don't think we have tried. And Barbara, to go back to your issue about the Telecommunications Act, I don't remember, I remember reading it back in the day, but I feel as if what's happened is that, because in those days we used to talk about cable, 
you know, um, how cable was regulated. There was a huge amount of work done in the United States about regulating cable. Um, but somehow since cable has become passe, we have seem to have just dropped the ball and not thought about it. And with regard to um, digital media, I think it's always the genie is out of the bottle before either parents or regulators think of sort of scrambling to figure out how to put it back in the bottle. It's not going to happen, I guess. Well, you know, our political system, the po you are the constituency when it comes to voting, but the politicians go, the constituency, the corporations who, who yeah. will give them the most money and then nothing, the legislation, they don't care about the well, America is America is also ruled that corporations are a peep are a person. So oh, yeah. well, given that, we yes, can do that, much. that dates back from something in the margin, which was never yeah. in a decision from from eighteen um, eighty six something in the the Santa Clara. So there's all sorts of issues that have been really just they take them out of context, and and this is what 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 the problem is. And of course, you look at Cornell College students, the cell phone, they turn it on in the middle of a, of a film. It's like, excuse me, we watch in the dark. But there's a ter terrible amount of isolation now. Um, I worry about young people that their social skills are so poor because they're so connected to their devices that they don't even have any connection to their environment the birds other people it's it's very sad i would contend i agree and i agree with you but i would also contend that i think the nature of communication or what it means to communicate has itself changed in the digital age so you know that children or parents are texting from one room to the other um it's and just changed dinner. Yeah, Jim, yeah, there was a, there was a couple that sat on the couch and texted to each other. They're sitting together. There's again, it's a, I I'm old, so I find this way of doing business is very peculiar. I like human interaction. I'm not going to sit there. I don't own a cell phone, but it's like how could you negate the importance of of you know spending time with other people? And letting this de the devices run your life. That's what we've come to in many respects, you know. So. Yeah, but, but you know, this, it, it is, I think it's a problem across the world. Um, but then when you look at uh, children in, let's say, resource poor contexts, um, the cell phone represents an entry to a world that they otherwise don't have mm -hmm. any access to materially. So it's very difficult to argue for, uh, you know, one kind of policy that would limit access or limit um, availability to children in every, uh, you know, of all kinds. So um, I think it, it becomes uh, difficult to pass regulation um, that's totalizing. Um, we need some flexibility in terms of how people can make decisions within their own context. So um, yeah, I think it's extremely complicated. I think also, you know, maybe researchers like us who, who've come from a pre-digital world and who have seen this shift, I think we're limited by our perspective as well. And it would be interesting to see how younger researchers who've grown up, like Devina's generation, for instance, who've grown up with technology, how they frame the questions. I think we're always framing questions from a perspective of a before the mm -hmm. digital. Um, so, yeah. yeah. Maybe your next book, you'll collaborate with, uh, with younger More people. young people. See, see what kind of you know, views, asking this, if the way they ask the questions, the way you ask the question, yeah. you know, but. We have discussed that. Yeah. yeah. Oh. <laughs> I, think I think there's another Bob question. Said it in, yeah, Bob in the chat, said it in yeah. chat best. Would you like to say it out loud for us? Where is he? 
you need to unmute yourself. Sure, it, it brings up some essential questions about who we are and what life is about and where we get the information that, that bases our, our response to it. It's not something that we think about, but clearly something in these times that we need to think about. And when I think, you know, the question is how do we stimulate conversations, uh, particularly among parents and children and teachers and children and between children uh, that explore those questions and, and, and let, how do we decide who we want to be and where we want to live? Um, rather than taking it passively uh, from what's being told to us by people who benefit our expense. And related to that, a question I was thinking of um, was I was interested in the, in the role of fear and how you saw the role of fear in, in your study, uh, the role of fear in media and how, how it was presented in media, how it may have stimulated fear uh, and the effects of that. Um, I think, sorry, Usha, were you going to say something? I, I think Devina perhaps would, was, would come the closest to be able, being able to answer that with some uh, background and in research because she's sort of explored the moral panics that seem to occupy, you know, the discourses around um, how scary all these new things are. So Usha or Devina? No, I just wanted to, I think Devina, probably I would turn it to her, but I think there are two aspects to this question, right? There is fear about media and what media does, but then there is also the fear that media stokes about the world. Um, so yeah. whether it is images of terror or uh, disaster or violence, uh, whether it is through news media or through entertainment media or games, uh, whatever it is. So there is, um, there are things that stoke fear. So that is something else. And I think maybe we need to think about those differently. Yeah, that's true. Davina, do you um, want to yeah. add to that? Sure. As far as uh, my work is concerned, and if you're talking about that kind of fear, where it's about techno panics or moral panics surrounding technology use of young people, um, it's there. <laughs> and it's there a lot. And it's there across cultural contexts. Because every time I see someone talking about uh, young people and their usage of digital and social media and now uh, AI-enabled uh, social media, uh, they keep thinking about, oh my God, where is this leading us to? We already have fake news. And now these images show up where there's a Pope in a Balenciaga jacket. <laughs> and where is the world headed to? So yes, that sort of fear is definitely there. And it's especially prominent when you're talking about young people whom we consider vulnerable and who we think we are in charge of protecting from, from these things. But I suppose the important thing is to look at how children take these. For all you know, children might actually be laughing about the Valencia folks saying, this is uncanny, this is not real, and you know, just having a gala time laughing about it. Also, I think, I mean, this is probably a completely different discussion, but I think, um, you know, children do not have the same level of trust in media as real as um, I think people of my generation, our generation probably do. So it was, you know, the whole seeing is believing myth um, that we grew up on. Now, you know, that seeing doesn't necessarily mean believing because so much is done to what is being seen you know, in some ways. Yeah, in that sense, sorry. No, go ahead. No, no, I was just saying that. So in that sense, they're more media literate than some people of our generation. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, go some ahead. Some children in some contexts. Yes. But, but you know, <laughs> even educational television, there's, there's like my son, you were only allowed a certain amount, then it's like, go play, go participate in your own development. And don't come and tell me what you need from the commercials, you know, if he was watching something. But even there, the educational television, that Sesame Street, I am not a fan of Sesame Street. That was, was like a commercial. It would move so quickly from one topic to the next. So attention span was not being developed. 
And why are we, you know, and, and the purpose was to bring children in who were in our lower socioeconomic environment, but why don't we raise people up instead of, you know, going down to the lowest common denominator? So even educational television, where you're sitting there, you know, go play, go outside, you know, and, and enjoy and find other children to, to be with. So even there, there's, there's a limit. There's a limit to the TV. And of course, there is commercial, and the commercial has gotten really, I don't even have television anymore, impossible. But there always was a division between the educational and the commercial. And commercial television, a lot of the um, these, it's not a soap opera, but like the series that would be on once a week. That was the, the, the language was fourth grade in the United States. It was very, very simplistic dialogue and the way things were expressed so that they wouldn't neglect, you know, to bring in everybody to, to watch, you know. I do have outlets. I don't want to hog the conversation. What about broadband? Like we have in the U.S., many rural communities do not get broadband. Rural communities are neglected anyway by the, the politics in this country. Is that an issue also in India where people are just left out of the process? Um, the digital divide is the real thing. It does exist, um, but there's a very big push to get more and more people online. Um, and it's not so much through wired broadband as uh, wireless. Um, uh, and um, right now we have about 50% internet penetration. Now, of course, that means many things. It could mean that, you know, one household has one cell phone, which has access to the internet and there are eight people in that household mm -hmm. so what yeah. kind of access does the child have especially a girl child have right um so it 50 percent doesn't necessarily mean 50 percent have good access to the internet but the prediction is that even this level of access is going to grow by 2030 to about 75 80 percent so there's a big push on the part of the government to cover rural communities. There are more and more cell phone towers being built. But um, yeah, it's still uneven quality of internet um, across the country. I'm yeah, afraid I that, yes, one last, yeah. one last comment from Bob, please. Oh, sorry, I, I, didn't, I thought someone else wanted to speak. Um, yeah, I'm interested in, in exploring how fear affects and forms our worldview. And I was on a long flight a while ago, and I was next to a four-year-old who was watching one video after another. And the consistent message in those videos is we live in a world of constant conflict, and violence is the best way to solve problems. And I thought to myself, oh my God, uh, this little girl possibly can't even read yet, and she's just being absorbed in this for hours and hours and hours. Um, and there needs to be a discussion. I wanted to start a discussion with her, but it wasn't my place as some stranger. Um, you know, what is this saying? And, and what do we really believe and who are we? And I think a lot of our problems stem from the point of view that human beings are essentially self-centered, aggressive, and competitive. And all of those things can be explained by fear. And, and they, were, they were introduced as a philosophy by people who lived like in the 30 years war, lived in an atmosphere of, of, of prolonged fear. Uh, and so we need to take a real look at who we are and the world we want to live in rather than the world we're told to live in. What, you, uh, what obligation do we owe to children? I mean, and to each other, you know, so that things can be different. Yeah, I like how you've centered fear in this in this conversation because so much of our politics is also based on fear, both in the US and in India and so so much around the world. Because the idea is that they are coming to whichever party you are, where, wherever you're looking at it from, somebody else is coming to get us and we, you know, we are in, we are in danger and therefore out of we act out of fear. Um, you're right, it's it's a 
it's an interesting it's it's an interesting way of looking at it and i think it's really important yeah, that's a, that's a really important point that one of the men who I think his name was Finkelstein, who was involved in using fear at a high level in political campaigns, once said that the candidate he was supporting or promoting for Senate was irrelevant to the campaign because he was sending all of these messages to destroy the other candidate. Right. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that, that kind of political campaigns, particularly uh, popular in the United States, though we are fast catching up. While talking about catching up, uh, we're a couple <laughs> of minutes over time, I apologize. Um, thank you so much, Usha ma'am, Samana ma'am. Uh, thank you for being here, talking about your book and taking us to the introduction, laying out the context of why this was important and how much ground you've already covered, although I see that you end your introductory chapter with there's so much more left to do. Of course, there always is. Um, for our Media Education Lab regulars and others who would like to join, uh, here's a link to all the future events of the Media Education Lab in the chat. Um, for those who can, uh, we're meeting again on the 6th of July uh, to continue our AI in the Classroom webinar series. And we'll have Dr. Ian O'Byrne talking about the future of AI in education. That's all from us today. Thank you so much for joining. And I'm going to stop recording in just a second. Thanks Thank so much. This was a great, great conversation and the information. Wonderful, as usual. It was terrific. Okay. Thank you for logging in and listening to us. It was wonderful talking to you. You're welcome. You're most welcome. It's a pleasure. Thank you.